The Glamour of the Snow by Algernon Blackwood. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read for you by Chiquito Crasto. The Glamour of the Snow by Algernon Blackwood. 1. Hibbert, always conscious of two worlds, was in this mountain village conscious of three. It lay on the slopes of the Valley Alps, and he had taken a room in the little post office where he could be at peace to write his book, yet at the same time enjoy the winter sports and find companionship in the hotels when he wanted it. The three worlds that met and mingled here seemed to his imaginative temperament very obvious, though it is doubtful if another mind less intuitively equipped would have seen them so well defined. There was the world of tourist English, civilized, quasi-educated, to which he belonged by birth. At any rate, there was the world of peasants to which he felt himself drawn by sympathy, for he loved and admired their toiling, simple life. And there was this other, which he could only call the world of nature. To this last, however, in virtue of a vehement poetic imagination and a tumultuous pagan instinct fed by his very blood, he felt that most of him belonged. The others borrowed from it, as it were, for visits. Here, with the soul of nature, hid his central life. Between all three was conflict, potential conflict. On the skating rink each Sunday, the tourists regarded the natives as intruders. In the church, the peasants plainly questioned, Why do you come? We are here to worship, you to stare and whisper. For neither of these two worlds accepted the other, and neither did nature accept the visitors, for it took advantage of their least mistakes, and indeed even of the peasant world accepted only those who were strong and bold enough to invade her savage domain with sufficient skill to protect themselves from several forms of death. Now Hibbert was keenly aware of this potential conflict and want of harmony. He felt outside yet caught by it, torn into three directions, because he was partly of each world, but wholly in only one. There grew in him a constant subtle effort, or at least desire, to unify them and decide positively to which he should belong and live in. The attempt, of course, was largely subconscious. It was the natural instinct of a richly imaginative nature, seeking the point of equilibrium, so that the mind could feel at peace and his brain be free to do good work. Among the guests, no one especially claimed his interest. The men were nice, but undistinguished, athletic schoolmasters, doctors snatching a holiday, good fellows all. The women equally various, the clever, the would-be fast, the dare-to-be dull, the women who understood, and the usual pack of jolly dancing girls and flappers. And Hibbert, with his forty-odd years of thick experience behind him, got on well with the lot. He understood them all. They belonged to the definite, predigested types that are the same the world over, and that he had met the world over long ago. But to none of them did he belong. His nature was too multiple to subscribe to the set of shibboleths of any one class. And since all liked him, and felt that somehow he seemed outside of them, spectator, looker-on, all sought to claim him. In a sense, therefore, the three worlds fought for him, natives, tourists, nature. It was thus began the singular conflict for the soul of Hibbert. In his own soul, however, it took place. Neither the peasants nor the tourists were conscious that they fought for anything, and nature, they say, is merely blind and automatic. The assault upon him of the peasants may be left out of account, for it is obvious that they stood no chance of success. The tourist world, however, made a gallant effort to subdue him to themselves. But the evenings in the hotel, when dancing was not in order, were English. The provincial imagination was set upon a throne and worshipped heavily through incense of the stupidest conventions possible. Hibbert used to go back early to his room in the post office to work. It is a mistake on my part to have realized that there is any conflict at all, he thought as he crunched home over the snow at midnight after one of the dances. It would have been better to have kept outside at all and done my work. Better, 
he added, looking back, down the silent village street to the church tower. And safer! The adjective slipped from his mind before he was aware of it. He turned with an involuntary start and looked about him. He knew perfectly well what it meant. This thought that had thrust its head up from the instinctive region. He understood without being able to express it fully the meaning that betrayed itself in the choice of the adjective. For if he had ignored the existence of this conflict, he would at the same time have remained outside the arena, whereas now he had entered the lists. Now this battle for his soul must have issue, and he knew that the spell of nature was greater for him than all other spells in the world combined, greater than love, revelry, pleasure, greater even than study. He had always been afraid to let himself go. His pagan soul dreaded her terrific powers of witchery, even while he worshipped. The little village already slept. The world lay smothered in snow. The chalet roofs shone white beneath the moon, and pitch-black shadows gathered against the walls of the church. His eye rested a moment on the square stone tower with its frosted cross that pointed to the sky then travelled with a leap of many thousand feet to the enormous mountains that brushed the brilliant stars. Like a forest rose the huge peaks above the slumbering village, measuring the night and heavens. They beckoned him. And something born of the snowy desolation, born of the midnight and the silent grandeur, born of the great listening hollows of the night, something lay twixt terror and wonder, dropped from the vast wintry spaces down into his heart and called him. Very softly, unrecorded in any word or thought his brain could compass, it laid its spell upon him. Fingers of snow brushed the surface of his heart. The power and quiet majesty of the winter's night appalled him. Fumbling a moment with the big unwieldy key, he let himself in and went upstairs to bed. Two thoughts went with him, apparently quite ordinary and sensible ones. What fools these peasants are to sleep through such a night! and the other. Those dances tire me. I'll never go again. My work only suffers in the morning. The claims of peasants and tourists upon him seemed thus in a single instant weakened. The clash of battle troubled half his dreams. Nature had sent her beauty of the night and won the first assault. The others, routed and dismayed, fled far away. 2. Don't go back to your dreary old post office. We're going to have supper in my room, something hot. Come and join us, hurry up. There had been an ice carnival, and the last party, tailing up the snow slope to the hotel, called him. The Chinese lanterns smoked and sputtered on the wires. The band had long since gone. The cold was bitter, and the moon came only momentarily between high driving clouds. From the shed, where the people changed from skates to snow boots, he shouted something to the effect that he was following. But no answer came. The moving shadows of those who had called were already merged high up against the village darkness. The voices died away. Doors slammed. Hibbert found himself alone on the deserted rink. And it was then, quite suddenly, the impulse came to stay and skate alone. The thoughts of the stuffy hotel room and of those noisy people with their obvious jokes and laughter, oppressed him. He felt a longing to be alone with the night, to taste her wonder all by himself, there beneath the stars, gliding over the ice. It was not yet midnight, and he could skate for half an hour. That supper party, if they noticed his absence at all, would merely think he had changed his mind and gone to bed. It was an impulse, yes, and not an unnatural one. Yet even at the time it struck him that something more than impulse lay concealed behind it. More than invitation, yet certainly less than command. There was a vague, queer feeling that he stayed because he had to, almost as though there was something he had forgotten, overlooked, left undone. Imaginative temperaments are often thus, and impulse is ever weakness. For with such ill-considered opening of the doors to hasty action, may come an invasion of other forces at the same time, forces merely waiting their opportunity, perhaps. He caught the fugitive warning even while he dismissed it as absurd, 
and the next minute he was whirling over the smooth ice in delightful curves and loops beneath the moon. There was no fear of collision. He could take his own speed and space as he willed. The shadows of the towering mountains fell across the rink, and a wind of ice came from the forest where the snow lay ten feet deep. The hotel lights winked and went out. The village slept. The high-wire netting could not keep out the wonder of the winter night that grew about him like a presence. He skated on and on, keen, exhilarating pleasure in his tingling blood, and weariness all forgotten. And then, midway, in the delight of rushing movement, he saw a figure gliding behind the wire netting, watching him. With a start that almost made him lose his balance, for the abruptness of the new arrival was so unlooked for, he paused and stared. Although the light was dim, he made out that it was the figure of a woman, and she was feeling her way along the netting, trying to get in. Against the white background of the snowfield, he watched her rather stealthy efforts as she passed with a silent step over the banked-up snow. She was tall and slim and graceful. He could see that, even in the dark. And then, of course, he understood. It was another adventurous skater like himself, stolen down unawares from hotel or chalet, and searching for the opening. At once, making a sign and pointing with one hand, he turned swiftly and skated over to the little entrance on the other side. But even before he got there, there was a sound on the ice behind him, and, with an exclamation of amazement he could not suppress, he turned to see her swerving up to his side, crossing the width of the rink. She had somehow found another way in. Hibbert, as a rule, was punctilious, and in these free and easy places perhaps especially so. If only for his own protection, he did not seek to make advances unless some kind of introduction paved the way. But for these two to skate together in the semi-darkness without speech, often of necessity brushing shoulders almost, was too absurd to think of. Accordingly, he raised his cap and spoke. His actual words he seemed unable to recall, nor what the girl said in reply, except that she answered him in accented English, with some commonplace about doing figures at midnight on an empty rink. Quite natural it was, and right. She wore grey clothes of some kind, though not the customary long gloves or sweater, for indeed her hands were bare, and presently when he skated with her, he wondered with something like astonishment at their dry and icy coldness. And she was delicious to skate with, supple, sure, and light, fast as a man, yet with the freedom of a child, sinuous and steady at the same time. Her flexibility made him wonder, and when he asked where she had learned, she murmured. He caught the breath against his ear, and recalled later that it was singularly cold, that she could hardly tell for she had been accustomed to the ice ever since she could remember. But her face he never properly saw. A muffler of white fur buried her neck to the ears, and her cap came down over her eyes. He only saw that she was young. Nor could he gather her hotel or chalet, for she vaguely pointed when he asked her, up the slopes. Just over there, she said, quickly taking his hand again. He did not press her. No doubt she wished to hide her escapade, and the touch of her hand thrilled him more than anything he could remember. Even through his thick glove he felt the softness of that cold and delicate softness. The clouds thickened over the mountains. It grew darker. They talked very little, and did not always skate together. Often they separated, curving about in corners by themselves, but always coming together again in the centre of the rink. And when she left him, thus, Hibbert was conscious of, yes, of missing her. He found a peculiar satisfaction, almost a fascination, in skating by her side. It was quite an adventure. These two strangers were the ice and snow and night. Midnight had long since sounded from the old church tower before they parted. She gave the sign, and he skated quickly to the shed, meaning to find a seat and help her take her skates off. Yet, when he turned, she had already gone. He saw her slim figure gliding away across the snow, and hurrying for the last time round the rink alone, he searched in vain for the opening she had twice used in this curious way. How very queer, he thought, referring to the wire netting. She must have lifted it and wriggled under. 
wondering how in the world she managed it, what in the world had possessed him to be so free with her, and who in the world she was, he went up the steep slope to the post office and so to bed, her promise to come again another night still ringing delightfully in his ears. And curious were the thoughts and sensations that accompanied him. Most of all, perhaps, was the half-suggestion of some dim memory that he had known this girl before, had met her somewhere, more, that she knew him. For in her voice, a low, soft, windy little voice it was, tender and soothing for all its quiet coldness, there lay some faint reminder of two others he had known, both long since gone, the voice of the woman he had loved, and the voice of his mother. But this time, through his dreams, there ran no clash of battle. He was conscious, rather, of something cold and clinging that made him think of sifting snowflakes, climbing slowly with entangling touch and thickness round his feet. The snow coming without noise, each flake so light and tiny, none can mark the spot whereon it settles. Yet the mass of it, able to smother whole villages, wove through the very texture of his mind, cold, bewildering, deadening effort, with its clinging network of ten million feathery touches. 3. In the morning Hibbert realized he had done perhaps a foolish thing. The brilliant sunshine that drenched the valley made him see this, and the sight of his work-table, with its typewriter, books, papers, and the rest, brought additional conviction. To have skated with a girl alone at midnight, no matter how innocently the thing had come about, was unwise, unfair, especially to her. Gossip in these little winter resorts was much was worse than in a provincial town. He hoped no one had seen them. Luckily the night had been dark. Most likely none had heard the ring of skates. Deciding that in future he would be more careful, he plunged into work and sought to dismiss the matter from his mind. But in his times of leisure the memory returned persistently to haunt him. When he skied, luged, or danced in the evenings, and especially when he skated on the little rink, he was aware that the eyes of his mind forever sought the strange companion of the night. A hundred times he fancied that he saw her, but always a sight deceived him. Her face he might not know, but he could hardly fail to recognize her figure. Yet nowhere among the others did he catch a glimpse of that slim young creature he had skated with alone beneath the clouded stars. He searched in vain. Even his inquiries as to the occupants of the private chalets brought no results. He had lost her. But the queer thing was that he felt as though she were somewhere close. He knew that she had not really gone. While people came and left with every day, it never once occurred to him that she had left. On the contrary, he felt assured that they would meet again. This thought he never quite acknowledged. Perhaps it was the wish that fathered it only. And even when he did meet her, it was a question of how he would speak and claim acquaintance, or whether she would recognize himself. It might be awkward. He almost came to dread a meeting, though dread, of course, was far too strong a word to describe an emotion that was half delight, half wondering anticipation. Meanwhile, the season was in full swing. Hibbert felt in perfect health, worked hard, skied, skated, luged, and at night danced fairly often, in spite of his decision. This dancing was, however, an act of subconscious surrender. It really meant he hoped to find her among the whirling couples. He was searching for her without quite acknowledging it to himself. And the hotel world, meanwhile, thinking it had won him over, teased and chafed him. He made excuses in a similar vein, but all the time he watched and searched and waited. For several days, the sky held clear and bright and frosty, bitterly cold, everything crisp and sparkling in the sun. But there was no sign of fresh snow, and the skiers began to grumble. On the mountains was an ice crust that made running dangerous. They wanted the frozen, dry, and powdery snow that makes for speed, renders steering easier, and falling less severe. But the keen east wind showed no signs of changing for a whole ten days. Then suddenly there came a touch of softer air, and the weather-wise began to prophesy. Hibbert, who was delicately sensitive to the least change in earth or sky, was perhaps the first to feel it. Only he did not prophesy. He knew through every nerve in his body that moisture had crept into the air, 
was accumulating, and that presently a fall would come, for he responded to the moods of nature like a fine barometer. And knowledge this time brought into his heart a strange little wavered emotion that was hard to account for, a feeling of unexplained uneasiness and disquieting joy. For behind it, woven through it rather, ran a faint exhilaration that connected remotely somewhere with that touch of delicious alarm, that tiny anticipating dread, that so puzzled him when he thought of his next meeting with the skating companion of the night. It lay beyond all words, all telling, this queer relationship between the two. But somehow the girl and Snow ran in a pair across his mind. Perhaps for imaginative writing men, more than for other workers, the smallest change of mood betrays itself at once. His work at any rate revealed the slight shifting of emotional values in his soul. Not that his writing suffered, but that it altered, subtly, as those changes of sky or sea or landscape that come with the passing of afternoon into evening, imperceptibly. A subconscious excitement sought to push outwards and express itself, and, knowing the uneven effect such moods produced in his work, he laid his pen aside and took instead to reading that he had to do. Meanwhile, the brilliance passed from the sunshine. The sky grew slowly overcast. By dusk, the mountain tops came singularly close and sharp. The distant valley rose into absurdly near perspective. The moisture increased, rapidly approaching saturation point, when it must fall in snow. Hibbert watched and waited. And in the morning the world lay smothered beneath its fresh white carpet. It snowed heavily till noon, thickly, incessantly, chokingly, a foot or more. Then the sky cleared. The sun came out in splendor. The wind shifted back to the east, and frost came down upon the mountains with its keenest and most biting tooth. The drop in the temperature was tremendous, but the skiers were jubilant. Next day the running would be fast and perfect. Already the mass was settling, and the surface freezing into those moss-like powdery crystals that make the ski run almost of their own accord, and with a faint sishing as of a bird's wings through the air. 4. That night there was excitement in the little hotel world. First because there was a bar costume, but chiefly because the new snow had come, and Hibbert went, felt drawn to go. He did not go in costume, but he wanted to talk about the slopes and skiing with the other men, and at the same time, ah, there was the truth, the deeper necessity that called, for the singular connection between the stranger and the snow again betrayed itself, utterly beyond explanation as before, but vital and insistent. Some hidden instinct in his pagan soul, heaven knows how he phrased it even to himself, if he phrased it at all, whispered that with the snow the girl would be somewhere about, would emerge from her hiding place, would even look for him. Absolutely unwarranted it was. He laughed while he stood before the little glass and trimmed his moustache, trying to make his black tie sit straight, and shook down his dinner jacket so that it should lie upon the shoulders without a crease. His brown eyes were very bright. I look younger than I usually do, he thought. It was unusual, even significant, in a man who had no vanity about his appearance and certainly never questioned his age or tried to look younger than he was. Affairs of the heart, with one tumultuous exception that left no fuel for lesser subsequent fires, had never troubled him. The forces of his soul and mind not called upon for work and obvious duties all went to nature. The desolate, wild places of the earth were what he loved. Night and the beauty of the stars and snow. And this evening he felt their claims upon him mightily stirring. A rising wildness caught his blood, quickened his pulse, woke longing and passion too. But chiefly snow. The snow whirred softly through his thoughts like white seductive dreams. For the snow had come, and she, it seemed, had somehow come with it into his mind. And yet he stood there before that twisted mirror, and pulled his tie and coat askew a dozen times, as though it mattered. What in the world is up with me? he thought. Then, laughing a little, he turned before leaving the room to put his private papers in order. 
The green Morocco desk that held them he took down from the shelf and laid upon the table. Tied to the lid was the visiting card with his brother's London address, in case of accident. On the way down to the hotel he wondered why he had done this, for though imaginative, he was not the kind of man who dealt in presentiments. Moods with him were strong, but ever held in leash. It's almost like a warning, he thought, smiling. He drew his thick coat tightly round the throat as the freezing air bit at him. Those warnings one reads off in stories sometimes. A delicious happiness was in his blood. Over the edge of the hills across the valley rose the moon. He saw her silver sheet the world of snow. Snow covered all. It smothered sound and distance. It smothered houses, streets, and human beings. It smothered life. 5. In the hall there was light and bustle. People were already arriving from other hotels and chalets, their costumes hidden beneath many wraps. Groups of men in evening dress stood about smoking, talking snow and skiing. The band was tuning up. The claims of the hotel world clashed about him faintly as of old. At the big glass windows of the veranda, peasants stopped a moment on their way home from the café to pier. Hibbert thought laughingly of that conflict he used to imagine. He laughed because it suddenly seemed so unreal. He belonged so utterly to nature and the mountains, and especially to those desolate slopes where now the snow lay thick and fresh and sweet, that there was no question of a conflict at all. The power of the newly fallen snow had caught him, proving it without effort. Out there, upon those lonely reaches of the moonlit ridges, the snow lay ready, masses and masses of it, cool, soft, inviting. He longed for it. It awaited him. He thought of the intoxicating delight of skiing in the moonlight. Then somehow, in vivid flashing vision, he thought of it while he stood there smoking with the other men and talking all the shop of skiing. And ever mysteriously blended with this power of the snow, poured also through his inner being the power of the girl. He could not disabuse his mind of the insinuating presence of the two together. He remembered that queer skating impulse of ten days ago, the impulse that had let her in, that any mind, even an imaginative one, could pass beneath the sway of such a fancy was strange enough. And Hibbert, while fully aware of the disorder, yet found a curious joy in yielding to it. This insubordinate centre that drew him towards old pagan beliefs had assumed command. With a kind of sensuous pleasure, he let himself be conquered. And snow that night seemed in everybody's thoughts. The dancing couples talked of it. The hotel proprietors congratulated one another. It meant good sport and satisfied their guests. Everyone was planning trips and expeditions, talking of slopes and telemarks, of flying speed and distance, of drifts and crust and frost. Vitality and enthusiasm pulsed in the very air. All were alert and active positive, radiating currents of creative life even into the stuffy atmosphere of that crowded ballroom. And the snow had caused it. The snow had brought it. All this discharge of eager, sparkling energy was due primarily to the snow. But in the mind of Hibbert, by some swift alchemy of his pagan yearnings, this energy became transmuted. It rarefied itself, gleaming in white and crystal currents of passionate anticipation which he transferred, as by a species of electrical imagination, into the personality of the girl, the girl of the snow. She somehow was waiting for him, expecting him, calling to him softly from those leagues of moonlit mountain. He remembered the touch of that cool, dry hand, the soft and icy breath against his cheek, the hush and softness of her presence in the way she came and the way she had gone again, like a flurry of snow the wind sent gliding up the slopes. She, like himself, belonged out there. He fancied that he heard her little windy voice come sifting to him through the snowy branches of the trees, calling his name, that haunting little voice that dived straight to the centre of his life as once, long years ago, two other voices used to do. But nowhere among the costumed dancers did he see her slender figure. He danced with one and all, distrait and absent, a stupid partner, as each girl discovered, his eyes ever turning towards the door and windows, 
hoping to catch the luring face, the vision, the vision that did not come, and at length hoping even against hope. For the ballroom thinned, groups left one by one, going home to their hotels and chalets. The band tired, obviously. People sat drinking lemon squashes at the little tables, the men mopping their foreheads, everybody ready for bed. It was close on midnight. As Hibbert passed through the hall to get his overcoat and snow boots, he saw men in the passage by the sport room, greasing their ski against an early start. Knapsack luncheons were being ordered by the kitchen swing doors. He sighed. Lighting a cigarette a friend offered him, he returned a confused reply to some question as to whether he could join their party in the morning. It seemed he did not hear it properly. He passed through the outer vestibule between the double glass doors and went into the night. The man who asked the question watched him go, an expression of anxiety momentarily in his eyes. Do you think he heard you? said one, laughing. You've got to shout to Hibbert. His mind's so full of his work. He works too hard, suggested the first, full of queer ideas and dreams. But Hibbert's silence was not rudeness. He had not caught the invitation, that was all. The call of the hotel world had faded. He no longer heard it. Another wilder call was sounding in his ears. For up the street he had seen a little figure moving. Close against the shadow of the baker's shop it glided, white, slim, enticing. 6. And at once into his mind passed the hush and softness of the snow yet with it a searching, crying wildness for the heights. He knew by some incalculable, swift instinct she would not meet him in the village street. It was not there, amid crowding houses, she would speak to him. Indeed, already she had disappeared, melted from view up the white vista of the moonlit road. Yonder, he divined, she waited where the highway narrowed abruptly into the mountain path beyond the chalets. It did not even occur to him to hesitate, mad though it seemed, and was, the sudden craving for the heights with her, at least for open spaces where the snow lay thick and fresh. It was too imperious to be denied. He does not remember going up to his room, putting the sweater over his evening clothes, and getting into the fur gauntlet gloves and the helmet cap of wool. Most certainly, he had no recollection of fastening on his key. He must have done it automatically. Some faculty of normal observation was in abeyance, as it were. His mind was out beyond the village, out with the snowy mountains and the moon. Henri de Fargo, putting up the shutters over his café windows, saw him pass and wondered mildly. A monsieur qui fait du ski à cette heure? Il est anglais, don? He shrugged his shoulders, as though a man had the right to choose his own way of death. And Marta Perotti, the hunchback wife of the shoemaker, looking by chance from her window, caught his figure moving swiftly up the road. She had other thoughts, for she knew and believed the old traditions of the witches and snow beings that steal the souls of men. She had even heard, twas said, the dreaded synagogue pass roaring down the street at night. And now, as then, she hid her eyes. They've called to him, and he must go she murmured, making the sign of the cross. But no one sought to stop him. Hibbert recalls only a single incident, until he found himself beyond the houses, searching for her along the fringe of forest where the moonlight met the snow in a bewildering frieze of fantastic shadows. And the incident was simply this, that he remembered passing the church. Catching the outline of its tower against the stars, he was aware of a faint sense of hesitation. A vague uneasiness came and went, jarred unpleasantly across the flow of his excited feelings, chilling exhilaration. He caught the instant's discord, dismissed it, and passed on. The seduction of the snow smothered the hint before he realized that it had brushed the skirts of warning. And then he saw her. She stood there, waiting in a little clear space of shining snow, dressed all in white, part of the moonlight in the glistening background, her slender figure just discernible. I waited, for I knew you would come. The silvery little voice of windy beauty flowed down to him. You had to come. I am ready, he answered. 
I knew it too. The world of nature caught him to its heart in those few words. The wonder and the glory of the night and snow. Life leaped within him. The passion of his pagan soul exulted. Rose in joy, flowed out to her. He neither reflected nor considered, but let himself go. Like the various schoolboy in the wildness of first love. Give me your hand, he cried. I'm coming. A little farther on, a little higher, came her delicious answer. Here it is too near the village and the church. And the words seemed wholly right and natural. He did not dream of questioning them. He understood that, with this little touch of civilization in sight, the familiarity he suggested was impossible. Once out upon the open mountains, mid the freedom of huge slopes and towering peaks, the stars and moon to witness, and the wilderness of snow to watch, they could taste an innocence of happy intercourse, free from the dead conventions that imprisoned literal minds. He urged his pace, yet did not quite overtake her. The girl always kept just a little bit ahead of his best efforts. And soon they left the trees behind, and passed on to the enormous slopes of the sea of snow that rolled in mountainous terror and beauty to the stars. The wonder of the white world caught him away. Under the steady moonlight, it was more than haunting. It was a living, quiet, bewildering power that deliciously confused the senses and laid a spell of wild perplexity upon the heart. It was a personality that cloaked and yet revealed itself through all this sheeted whiteness of snow. It rose, went with him, fled before and followed after. Slowly it dropped lithe, gleaming arms about his neck, gathering him in. Certainly some soft persuasion coaxed his very soul, urging him ever forwards, upwards, on towards the higher icy slopes. Judgment and reason left their throne, it seemed, completely, as in the madness of intoxication. The girl, slim and seductive, kept always just ahead, so that he never quite came up with her. He saw the white enchantment of her face and figure, something that streamed about her neck flying like a reed of snow in the wind, and heard the alluring accents of a whispering voice that called from time to time. A little farther on, a little higher, then we'll run home together. Sometimes he saw her hand stretched out to find his own, but each time, just as he came with her, he saw her still in front, the hand and arm withdrawn. They took a gentle angle of ascent. The toil seemed nothing. In this crystal, wine-like air, fatigue vanished. The sishing of the ski through the powdery surface of the snow was the only sound that broke the stillness. This, with his breathing and the rustle of her skirts, was all he heard. Cold moonshine, snow and silence held the world. The sky was black and the peaks beyond cut into it like frosted wedges of iron and steel. Far below the valley slept, the village long since hidden out of sight. He felt he could never tire. The sound of the church clock rose from time to time, faintly through the air, more and more distant. Give me your hand. It's time now to turn back. Just one more slope, she laughed. That ridge above us, then we'll make for home and her low voice mingled pleasantly with the purring of her ski. His own seemed harsh and ugly by comparison. But I have never come so high before. It's glorious, this world of silent snow and moonlight, and you. You're a child of the snow, I swear. Let me come up closer to see your face and touch your little hand. Her laughter answered him. Come on, a little higher. Here we are quite alone together. It's magnificent, he cried. But why did you hide away so long? I've looked and searched for you in vain ever since we skated. He was going to say ten days ago, but the accurate memory of time had gone from him. He was not sure whether it was days or years or minutes. His thoughts of earth were scattered and confused. You look for me in the wrong places. He heard her murmur just above him. You looked in places where I never go. Hotels and houses kill me. I avoid them. She laughed, 
a fine, shrill, windy little laugh. I loathe them too. He stopped. The girl had suddenly come quite close. A breath of ice passed through his very soul. She had touched him. But this awful cold, he cried out sharply, this freezing cold that takes me. The wind is rising. It's a wind of ice. Come, let us turn. But when he plunged forward to hold her, or at least to look, the girl was gone again. And something in the way she stood there, a few feet beyond, and stared down into his eyes so steadfastly in silence, made him shiver. The moonlight was behind her, but in some odd way he could not focus sight upon her face, although so close. The gleam of eyes he caught, but all the rest seemed white and snowy, as though he looked beyond her, out into space. The sound of the church bell came up faintly from the valley far below, and he counted the strokes. Five. A sudden curious weakness seized him as he listened. Deep within it was, deadly, yet somehow sweet, and hard to resist. He felt like sinking down upon the snow and lying there. They had been climbing for five hours. It was, of course, the warning of complete exhaustion. With a great effort he fought and overcame it. It passed away as suddenly as it came. We'll turn, he said, with a decision he hardly felt. It will be dawn before we reach the village again. Come at once. It's time for home. The sense of exhilaration had utterly left him. An emotion that was akin to fear swept coldly through him. But a whispering answer turned it instantly to terror. A terror that gripped him horribly and turned him weak and unresisting. Our home is here. A burst of wild, high laughter, loud and shrill, accompanied the words. It was like a whistling wind. The wind had risen, and clouds obscured the moon. A little higher, where we cannot hear the wicked bells, she cried, and for the first time seized him deliberately by the hand. She moved, was suddenly close against his face. Again she touched him. And Hibbert tried to turn away and escape and so trying found for the first time that the power of the snow, that other power which does not exhilarate but deadens effort, was upon him. The suffocating weakness that it brings to exhausted men, luring them to the sleep of death in her clinging soft embrace, lulling the will and conquering all desire for life, this was awfully upon him. His feet were heavy and entangled. He could not turn or move. The girl stood in front of him, very near. He felt her chilly breath upon his cheeks. Her hair passed blindingly across his eyes, and that icy wind came with her. He saw her whiteness close. Again, it seemed, his sight passed through her into space as though she had no face. Her arms were round his neck. She drew him softly downwards to his knees. He sank. He yielded utterly. He obeyed. Her weight was upon him, smothering, delicious. The snow was to his waist. She kissed him softly on the lips, the eyes, all over his face. And then she spoke his name in that voice of love and wonder, the voice that held the accent of two others, both taken over long ago by death, the voice of his mother and of the woman he had loved. He made one more feeble effort to resist, then, realizing even while he struggled that this soft weight about his heart was sweeter than anything life could ever bring, he let his muscles relax and sank back into the soft oblivion of the covering snow. Her wintry kisses bore him into sleep. 7. They say that men who know the sleep of exhaustion in the snow find no awakening on the hither side of death. The hours passed and the moon sank down below the white world's rim. Then suddenly there came a little crash upon his breast and neck, and Hibbert woke. He slowly turned, bewildered, heavy eyes upon the desolate mountains, stared dizzily about him, tried to rise. At first his muscles would not act. A numbing, aching pain possessed him. He uttered a long, thin cry for help, and heard its faintness swallowed by the wind. And then he understood vaguely 
why he was only warm, not dead. For this very wind that took his cry had built up a sheltering mound of driven snow against his body while he slept. Like a curving wave it ran beside him. It was the breaking of its overtoppling edge that caused the crash, and the coldness of the mass against his neck that woke him. Dawn kissed the eastern sky. Pale gleams of gold shot every peak with splendor. But ice was in the air, and the dark and frozen snow blew like powder from the surface of the slopes. He saw the points of his ski projecting just below him. Then he remembered. It seems he had just strength enough to realize that, could he but rise and stand, he might fly with terrific impetus towards the woods and the village far beneath. The ski would carry him. But if he failed and fell... How he contrived it, Hibbert never knew. This fear of death somehow called out his whole available reserve force. He rose slowly, balanced a moment, then, taking the angle of an immense zigzag, started down the awful slopes like an arrow from a bow, and automatically the splendid muscles of the practiced skier and athlete saved and guided him, for he was hardly conscious of controlling either speed or direction. The snow stung face and eyes like fine steel shot. Ridge after ridge flew past. The summits raced across the sky. The valley leaped up with bounds to meet him. He scarcely felt the ground beneath his feet as the huge slopes and distance melted before the lightning speed of that descent from death to life. He took it in four mile-long zigzags, and it was the turning at each corner that nearly finished him. For then the strain of balancing taxed to the verge of collapse the remnants of his strength. Slopes that have taken hours to climb can be descended in a short half-hour on ski. But Hibbert had lost all count of time. Quite other thoughts and feelings mastered him in that wild, swift dropping through the air that was like the flight of a bird. For ever close upon his heels came following forms and voices with the whirling snow dust. He heard that little silvery voice of death and laughter at his back. Shrill and wild, with the whistling of the wind past his ears, he caught its pursuing tones. But in anger now, no longer soft and coaxing. And it was accompanied. She did not follow alone. It seemed a host of these flying figures of the snow chased madly just behind him. He felt them furiously smite his neck and cheeks, snatch at his hands and try to entangle his feet and ski in drifts. His eyes, they blinded, and they caught his breath away. The terror of the heights and snow and winter desolation urged him forward in the maddest race with death a human being ever knew. And so terrific was the speed that before the gold and crimson had left the summits to touch the ice lips of the lower glaciers, he saw the friendly forest far beneath swing up and welcome him. And it was then, moving slowly along the edge of the woods, he saw a light. A man was carrying it. A procession of human figures was passing in a dark line laboriously through the snow. And he heard the sound of chanting. Instinctively, Without a second's hesitation, he changed his course. No longer flying at an angle as before, he pointed his ski straight down the mountainside. The dreadful steepness did not frighten him. He knew full well it meant a crashing tumble at the bottom, but he also knew it meant a doubling of his speed, with safety at the end. For, though no definite thought passed through his mind, he understood that it was the village curé who carried that little gleaming lantern in the dawn, and that he was taking the host to a chalet on the lower slopes to some peasant in extremis. He remembered her terror of the church and bells. She feared the holy symbols. There was one last wild cry in his ears as he started, a shriek of the wind before his face, and a rush of stinging snow against closed eyelids, and then he dropped through empty space. Speed took sight from him. It seemed he flew off the surface of the world. Indistinctly he recalls the murmur of men's voices, the touch of strong arms that lifted him, and the shooting pain as the ski were unfastened from the twisted ankle. For when he opened his eyes again to normal life, he found himself lying in his bed at the post office with a doctor at his side. But for years to come, 
The story of Mad Hibbert's skiing at night is recounted in that mountain village. He went, it seems, up slopes and to a height that no man in his senses ever tried before. The tourists were agog about it for the rest of the season, and the very same day two of the bolder men went over the actual ground and photographed the slopes. Later Hibbert saw these photographs. He noticed one curious thing about them, though he did not mention it to anyone. There was only a single track. End of The Glamour of the Snow by Algernon Blackwood. Read for you by Chiquito Crasto, Birmingham, Alabama.